Key results are the things you're going to do to move that number. But here's the thing where most people spin out. There should be a break mechanism on the things that you're doing. When you say, you know, it is not helping us achieve our goal. It's not moving the number in the direction we want it to go. Let's stop. But I find out many teams, people will do things that I call zombie key results. So you see, if we didn't know what failure looked like, them not getting through the quick starts very fast and not interacting with the sandboxes, we may have shipped something that looked good, but people weren't able to use. You must always know what success and failure look like, or you will spend your time implementing things that aren't any benefit for people. If you can bring that mindset to not just your team, but the entire org, to your stakeholders, your work will continue to evolve and grow long after you've moved on. That is the real work. The real hard work is to instill this culture with the people that you work with. And that can be a challenge because humans are difficult. They've been burned. They've been burned by OKRs and KPIs. Hi. Welcome back, if you just listened to part one of our conversation with Rachel Lena Bors. This is part two. My name is Lara Vash, and I'm going to be the host again. I asked Rachel to be my guest on the apropos of the React Dev Portal, taking, among others, the grand prize of the Dev Portal Awards last December. The first part was riveting, and so let's listen in. Here we continue. Is it a developer portal or a documentation site? We talk about all that a mature, full-fledged developer portal encompasses, for example, marketing being your heavyweight stakeholder. Then Rachel shares her own experience-based wisdom as team lead, that to be able to set your team's KPIs and OKIs right, as in avoid the zombies, you must always know what success and failure looks like in your context. How do you see the role of a developer portal now. Who are the stakeholders? Everybody. <laughs> That's the problem. I have worked on many what people call docs sites, mm -hmm. and dev portals tend to be masqueraded as documentation sites. You get approached from people like, oh, our docs need help. And you get there and you think, oh, I'm going to be writing some documentation, you know, I'm going to have some API references and some guides. But then you find out that your site actually is educating the market. The site is serving as uh, like an entrance way to a funnel that marketing is tracking that various people want to ensure that like, oh, it also has to show off upcoming features. And where does the blog fit into this? You can find out like a dev portal itself can encompass more than just documentation. It can be the place where sales pages are, where blog support, your mandate can grow vastly, which is actually kind of exciting because if you're a power hungry person who likes to be in charge of a lot of things and the success of a product, being in charge of documentation is a foot in the door where you can eventually find yourself responsible for the gateway to the product itself and the KPIs that come with that. But for the most part, various stakeholders end up being in charge of those. And if you're in charge of docs, that's a nice way of saying you don't have engineering resources. If you're in charge of a dev portal, that means you are in charge of uh, engineering resources. And for documentation, the only stakeholders are your customer, support, and the engineering staff that's shipping. So those are, you know, our, our product, I guess, products in there too, depending on the, the shape of your company. But if it's a dev portal, marketing is involved as well. Um, and marketing, uh, that has been my experience. The real difference in stakeholders between just docs, capital J, capital D, just docs, and a dev portal is that marketing comes in. Um, and marketing is a pretty big stakeholder. Indeed. Who would you put in charge of the developer experience or user experience, let's put it wider, once marketing is involved? Well, I think you're going to have a lot of people arguing uh, who should be in charge of that. Design will have very strong opinions. Marketing will have very strong opinions. And of course, the engineers themselves or developer advocacy will have very strong opinions. But in this, I think it is best to partner with design specifically with a design team that's capable of prototyping, that is to say, coding a little bit. If you think of a developer portal as just um, 
like a WordPress site, you know, reams of text that you're publishing. And that's one thing. But there's so much more that you can do with these sites if you bring eye for interactivity and the very unique experiences that people can have. Right now, Rodrigo and I over at Code Hike, fun little open source project here, we're working on building an example of a tutorial for a particular uh, property, a friend of ours. And we're looking at it and we're sitting back and we're going, well, you know what? When you're walking through the tutorial, you really need to have two pages open, one for the development server and one for the website, ex uh, the updated site example. Do you think the interactive sandbox should have two preview panes to show this? Yeah, you know, that way, you know, people get to see one change and see how the other one changes at the same time. We don't have to like stack a bunch of screenshots in there nor ask them to flip between windows. Let's do that. You need to be able to have a conversation like that to really unlock new experiences, better experiences. Now, maybe we're not working with, um, you know, a code that's that exciting. You're thinking maybe, you know, oh, it's just a pile of APIs. Just people need a reference page. It's not that. But you do need to have collaborators who are thinking about how they could really, as Disney put it, plus the experience. There are little ways, like even there, showing two preview panels side by side that would help tell that story, show it instead of tell it better. And you do need collaborators for that. You do need them. And the best collaborators are finder visual thinkers. You'll find them in design. So finding allies in design, if you really want to help uh, build a better experience, or prototypers, people who think about UI, this is, this is where you find those people. And marketing is great. They have needs, but marketing isn't the one that comes up with you know, the idea of showing two panes next to each other or illustrating something with a diagram diagram system. Uh, that's going to come from your visual thinkers. Unless, of course, you have a strong visual thinker in the marketing team, which can happen. It can. You were mentioning something that I want to cue in here, which was, it's important not to mistake KPIs for OKRs. So key performance indicators are not your objectives and key results. And it felt to me that you have a very strong opinions here about it. In in what context did it did it boil up for it when and why is it so important to think this through for developer portals, you think? I have worked at large companies and I've worked at small companies, and nowhere have I found people actually using OKRs and KPIs effectively. Um I think people get sort of like NPS, Net Promoter Score. People use NPS in the wrong way and it does damage. People try to use OKRs and KPIs in the wrong way and it causes harm. But if you use them in the right way, they can really help you know what is working and what is not working. And I always have taken a metrics-based approach to my work on these flagship products. The first thing I've done on every project is I've installed ways to check on the overall health of the portal. Now, if you're working with marketing and putting things at the top of the funnel, this will involve setting up, for instance, uh, ways of tracking conversion from things like tutorials, etc. But on documentation, for instance, you're going to be checking to see, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, and triaging people's feedback on those pages into a place for the technical writers to act on it. And the more things are acted upon, the higher the approval rating of the overall doc space should be. Average page age lets you know if things are being appropriately attended to. All of these numbers can give you an overview of, at any given time, your dev portal's health and whether it's getting sicker or getting healthier. And these numbers can help you make arguments for why uh, decisions you've made are effective. It can help you measure the impact of uh, like a a small rollout of something. Say you launch a few new tutorials and they really convert that can justify launching more. But it all comes back to figuring out what success looks like. Before we use any of these bullshit acronyms, let's just describe what does success look like when someone comes to this portal? Is it that they get answers to their questions and they can go home quickly? Is it that they are introduced to the technology, get to an aha moment, and then make a purchasing decision? What does success look like? Sketch them out with your stakeholders. And then ask the question of, how do we measure that success? 
can we distill this down to a single point of data that tells us warmer or colder? And then how do we measure that? Do we use a bit of tracking? Do we watch how long people are spending on a page? Are we watching that on reference pages, people quickly copy and then leave the page? It might look like a bounce, but in this situation, that could be a success story if people quickly find what they came for and left. And you sketch these out and you build a dashboard. Good job. These are your KPIs. The ladder up to form a general overall health score for how well the documentation is being tended, how much the uh, ingestion points are converting, etc. Then you start becoming a scientist. You use experiments and the scientific method to figure out how you can make those numbers even better. And this is where objectives and key results come in. Your objective is the thing you're trying to do. I want this number to go up. I want this number to go down. Key results are the things you're going to do to move that number. Here's the thing where most people spin out. There should be a break mechanism on the things that you're doing. When you say, you know, it is not helping us achieve our goal. It's not moving the number in the direction we want it to go. Let's stop. But I find out many teams, people will do things that I call zombie key results, where they'll say, ah, our developer advocacy team is going to release a new video every week for this half. Okay, well, how do you know if it's achieving the result you want? What result? What do you want people to do when they watch the video? Oh, we just want to increase awareness. Well, how will you know that awareness has been increased? Um, we, I mean, you just don't understand. And that's how that conversation goes. You need to have a number. Increase in search, searches on Google for this product. Um, number of click-throughs. Use of a, 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 a code at the end to get a free prize. Anything, anything. You have to have something to let you know it's working. You have to, even if it's qualitative data, just watching somebody, I do this all the time, user research style, sitting on their shoulder and watching them and having them go, oh, I didn't know I could interact with this. Or, wow, that's really cool. You know, that could be even a KPI. Just the number of people who interacted with something and then, or they got through a tutorial faster. But you need to have signal that your work is having an intended effect. Otherwise, you won't stop doing it. And then you will be spending your limited resources, your, you know, your one designer, your one engineer, working on things that aren't helping people learn, aren't helping the customer, aren't getting them where they need to go faster. So you must know when to stop. That is the most important thing, is to know what you're trying to get out of it, out of any effort, and also know when to stop. When is it enough? When do you take those resources and put them into something else? Just because a few tutorials uh, help convert doesn't mean you should have hundreds of them, unless you have clear signal that hundreds of tutorials are going to convert a lot. You need to know when enough is enough. And so this is, um, when I approach these different projects, I would always look for signal that what we were doing was right or not. When we first implemented uh, interactive sandboxes on React.dev, for instance, I was still running user researching uh, tests where I would invite community members to come look at the, the prototype site and walk through. And I just watched them. I learned this from my days when I worked as, in UX. And I wouldn't lead them or ask them to do things. I just watched them interact with it and have them talk out loud. And they weren't interacting with the sandboxes. I was like, hmm. But my theory was, if they interacted with the sandboxes, they would get through the tutorials faster. But these people are being slower, and it's taking as long as they usually did. What do you think would happen if you clicked on that? Oh, I did, it didn't look clickable. I didn't think, I thought this was a screenshot. And that was it. The sandboxes didn't look interactive. People didn't realize at that time that they could interact with them. So I went back to the design and engineering teams, and we figured out a way to make them look interactive. And that unstuck people, and then they were able to get through the quick starts much, much faster. So you see, if we didn't know what failure looked like, them not getting through the quick starts very fast, them not interacting with the sandboxes, we may have shipped something that looked good, but people weren't able to use. You must always know what success and failure look like, or you will spend your time implementing things that aren't any benefit for people. On a meta level, we are also advocating a lot for this, that it's one thing that the API is well-designed and well-documented, but you got to be able to explain the affordances 
that it gives people who want to use it because it's not necessarily common knowledge and you have to explain those affordances as well, just like interactivity is an affordance of a sandbox. Exactly. And this is where having visual thinkers can be really helpful. Yeah. Um, for instance, I could see that the cursor wasn't changing on hover over the, the sandbox and that there weren't numbers down the left side of the sandbox the same way people would expect in a code editor. Mm -hmm. Simply adding the numbers and changing the cursor was enough to get eight out of 10 study participants to interact with the sandboxes per session. And they had that was zero prior, you know, so these are big number changes. You were saying about for objectives that it's it's good to build in when do you check that you should abort or continue, which is kind of surprising for me because when I first a long time ago learned about OKRs, the first thing that I understood that the whole mindset is that is cyclical, that it's like baked into the very idea that there is a checkpoint every once in a while. So, but when there is this big hyper object, a developer portal, so not a dogs portal, but a developer portal with a lot of stakeholders, it gets better, let's hope, it evolves, it serves more and more stakeholders. Is there a point when is enough is enough? Is there a point when you need to fork? Is there a point when you lose the original purpose? And I'm playing the devil's advocate here. I haven't worked on developer portals quite like the ones I imagine you and your audience have. I mean, I worked on one, two in open source, one at AWS, another for a startup, and of course, MDN, which is the portal for all things um, web APIs. These are, a lot of them are closer to docs themselves. But when I think about, when I've looked at things that have gone off the rails, it's usually happened when there's, sometimes you get a culture of documentation in an org, or when you inherit a site that people have been contributing to without any editorial oversight, without any constraints or goals. And there's just content, content reams and reams, and it's of questionable quality. And people are getting confused by this outdated, stinky, old. And when you find that there are KRs that are running constantly, that are fueling this, for instance, maybe there's an advocacy team that has a goal every half of contributing X number of you know, tutorials, but they have no goals around maintaining the tutorials currently already there. So you have a bunch of constantly aging tutorials. Or here's one that comes up quite a bit, rather than making high quality content that you are maintaining and constantly pruning and updating. This goes for documentation teams as well as marketing teams. People are focusing on that cyclical ship, 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 ship mindset. And you can find a rather devilish uh, a devilish team up between a developer advocacy team and the marketing team to create blogs on a regular drumbeat, a new blog, teaching people something, having them do something. And these blogs go out of date. They go out of date really fast, but they show up in search engine results and they can become um, major in, in points for people. And this is what I've seen is that they um, can end up with more content being unmaintained in, the, in a blog than you would have in your portal. So rather than having really strong entry points, uh, really strong educational resources, et cetera, you have a gigantic blog and people are contributing to it because it helps them check boxes. Here's where you have to go in and you have to change the key results and the objectives of these collaborators. And this can be tough because marketing really wants new content to drive uh, their KPIs, you know, number of activations. And advocacy wants to be able to say that they're a part of that flywheel. But retention, documentation health, overall ratings of the materials that are provided, these should also be key performance indicators that all teams are held accountable for. And you should try to introduce objectives into these cycles that help push those indicators, not just the ones that are pushed by creating more content. 
You need to also introduce mechanisms for maintaining the content, constantly improving the landing pages, assessing what it is that people are looking for. It changes from year to year. So I have seen runaway cycles in the past, both in over-contribution and in lack of maintenance and lack of revisitation. You know, what does what does failure look like? It can look like a completely out-of-date, unreliable documentation base with um, untended marketing landing pages and a very active blog that if you see people for instance, uh, going back and updating blog posts, that right there is telling you that this has gone off the rails because a blog is not supposed to be updated. A blog is, at that point, you're you're having a very lopsided developer portal that's skewing towards the ephemeral and moving away from the reliable. And if anything, you want the portal to be reliable, a place where people go and they know they can find answers. It sounds like you described more than just problems with dev portals like the pharmaceutical industry came to mind, but that's another podcast. The pharmaceutical industry came to mind. <laughs> In a way of, you know, producing more and more new things, whereas uh, ultimately everybody just wanted to be healthy with as least interaction as possible, please. But yeah. That's an excellent metaphor. What would you like to leave the listeners with? If there's one thing you want them to certainly remember. Team dashboard or metrics health dashboard comes to mind, but maybe you have something else. I love measuring things and it definitely helps me see, you know, validate that the initiatives that I've started are having the right impact. And it helps me set up mechanisms that ensure that everyone continues to evolve and create for the portal at a good pace. But you have to remember that in the end, you can't make anyone do anything. It's the human aspect of the work that determines the longevity of its impact. I have learned that to be good at one's craft is amazing, but to be good at people is to make everyone amazing. You can introduce these different metric systems and they can be people can be held accountable to them while you're there. But the important thing is that you help bring people along with this way of thinking, the scientific method, introducing a culture of experimentation to your teams and objective critique on the teams around, is this the right thing to be doing? To bring everyone along for that journey and help make that a part of the culture. Because at that point, if you can instill this kind of attitude, this sort of accountability of, well, why are we continuing this effort? Perhaps it is time for us to do this other effort. If you can bring that mindset to not just your team, but the entire org, to your stakeholders, your work will continue to evolve and grow long after you've moved on. That is the real work. The real hard work is to instill this culture with the people that you work with. And that can be a challenge because humans are difficult. They've been burned. They've been burned by OKRs and KPIs. That's something people do at big companies. We're not like that here. Or they've worked with people who have been unaccountable for their decisions and they're unlikely to trust this new methodology or they don't see the point in having a meeting every month to discuss the health of the, the developer portal. But it is important to build these alliances, to bring people along with your way of thinking and to invest in the customer always be orienting around the customer. And if you can do this, you'll be very proud of your work long after you've left because people will still be doing that good work and thinking the way you have taught them to. That is the real challenge, I think, in creating this touch point for the people who come to your product. Rachel, thank you for that. Everything that you said and for the closing uh, thoughts also, I couldn't agree more. So thank you for saying this out loud. And I'm very happy that you were our guest and see you at the next interview at the next adventure and i'm not sure if it's appropriate but if people are interested in hearing more about how to lead these different cultures i have a substack at nearest neighbors dot substack dot com that's a neighbors spelled n-a-b-o-r-s it's a little programming joke currently i'm writing a piece on it's a, a four-part series on I call it managing each other, managing Mm -hmm. ourselves, but I really should just name it how to be an adult in professional relationships. Uh, (laughs) It's just gathering the different thinking and approaches I've noticed that work that we all struggle with Mm -hmm. at one point or another in our career. 
And not just how to manage ourselves through these challenges, but also how to work with people, be they reports, peers, or leaders who are also having these struggles. We are all humans, and the hardest part of getting work done as a human is other humans. So getting good at that is a valuable investment of your time. Absolutely. Very much. Thank you. And see you the next time we can talk. Looking forward to it, Laura. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovix Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.